finds that there is a plausible case that Israel is committing crimes of genocide and sends Israel for trial on genocide charges, it doesn't get much more serious than that. I always ask the journalists, though it never made it into print yet, let's see if I can do it this time. If the by-election had been in February of 1940 or 41, would anyone seriously have condemned me for putting the crimes of the Holocaust at the center of my uh, election campaign? Actually, in some papers, they would, uh, because some of the papers were supporting the black shirts. Hurrah for the black shirts, screamed the Daily Mail uh, in the run-up to the Second World War. Some of them would, but most would not, I hope. And yet, the same fourth estate seemed or pretended to find it inexplicable that I would put a genocide in Gaza in front of the voters in a by-election in 2024. Thanks, BBC uh, Ben Wright. Since you'll be talking about foreign affairs, I imagine, most of all, do you think Hamas should be allowed to run Gaza in the future, despite the atrocities of October 7th? Perhaps they should. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps they should let the BBC pick the government of Gaza. Do you think the should they? Well, these are two very big questions that would take me some time to deal with uh, and do justice to. But it's an intriguing question, dripping with imperial condescension. Do I think God, that Hamas should be allowed? to govern Gaza. Should we ask Britain to decide who runs Gaza or the BBC, perhaps? The people of Palestine must pick their own governments. I would not myself have voted for Hamas. I'm an Arafat man and have been since the 1970s. But the Palestinian people picked Hamas. And as I said in some quite substantial speeches here back in 2008, when the siege began, no good can come of former countries, particularly former colonizing countries, trying to pick the leaders of other people's uh, lands. Ukraine is a very long story indeed, not fit for an outdoor press conference. But I absolutely oppose the ironclad consensus for war across the two front benches in this British Parliament. And many people in Britain agree with me. Well, he was really talking about Muslims, because that's the imminent theme of his I think, forlorn hopes of re-election, to whip up Islamophobic, racist fervor in the likes of GB News, uh, which has been uh, at the forefront. Yes, I'm talking about you. Uh, GB News at the forefront, presenter after presenter, program after program, pumping out hatred of Muslims, thinly disguised as hatred of extremism. But when you ask them, what do you mean by extremism? Who are the extremists? They can never tell. It's clear to me that Sunak has identified Muslims and Gaza as the proximate center of that wedge issue that he intends to use uh, as perhaps his only hope of re-election. It's quite clear that there's going to be a raft of measures uh, that will take away still further freedoms from the British people, freedom to speak, freedom to assemble, freedom to protest and to demonstrate, and if they had their way, freedom to elect people that the establishment doesn't like. That was also the meaning of his uh, rather embarrassing, impromptu uh, uh, performance outside number 10. And what do I mean by a wedge issue? They want to force Starmer either to stand up and defend the democratic rights of the British people, including the rights of its religious 
and ethnic minorities, and if he does that, I'm a Dutchman, or to engage him in what will turn out to be a Dutch auction of nastiness. If he chooses, as I suspect he will, the latter, that's going to allow us and independent candidates to pick up potentially millions of votes from those who treasure the free uh, rights that we have enjoyed uh, since the Second World War uh, in this country and who wish to defend the Muslim communities in Britain. Uh, either way, that suits Rishi Sunak. So that's what I'm predicting here. The next election will be about Muslims and will be about the taking away of civil liberties in this country. It's Sunak's last hope. I pray for the social peace of our country that it's a forlorn hope. Well, you wouldn't be here and all these people wouldn't be here if they suspected that I was only a single MP with no party to back me. That's, I think, a given. If I were John Doe from anywhere that had just won a by-election last Thursday, none of you would be here. Consult the record. The truth is that you know, and certainly Keir Starmer knows, that I'm speaking for a very large number of people in Britain, and that in dozens, if not scores, of parliamentary constituencies, people who support my point of view, or who will vote for it, or who will vote for independents who think similarly, could alter the outcome of the general election. If I give you just one example, Angela Rayner has a parliamentary majority, I think, of around 3,000. There's at least 15,000 supporters of my point of view in her constituency. So we'll be putting a candidate up against her, uh, either a Workers' Party candidate or more likely an independent can candidate that we support, and that will vitally affect the election of the Labour deputy leader. And there are many constituencies in London, from Ilford to uh, Bethnal Green in the heart of the city of London, in Birmingham, uh, in, uh, in other parts of the West Midlands, in northwest England, in the towns around Rochdale, Oldham, Blackburn, Burnley, Nelson, Bury. We'll be putting candidates up in all these places, and we will either win or we'll make sure that Keir Starmer doesn't win. Are you going to stand in Rochdale again? Yes. Yes. Are you going to live there? I already am living there. Well, the ICJ uh, is the reference point here. Uh, I know you didn't cover the case uh, at the ICJ. You didn't report uh, the findings of the ICJ. In fact, on your television channel, I never saw a single reference to the International Court of Justice, the highest court in the world. But if you did read it, you would find adumbrated some of the most foul, atrocious crimes against humanity that we've seen since the Second World War. Anyone else who hasn't asked a question? Yes, ma'am. Who are you from? Uh, yes, I've spoken to several uh, other MPs, none of them Labour, I should confess, uh, but uh, Conservatives. Uh, Ulster Unionists or Democratic Unionists. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, my office is situated uh, in a corridor in which every other member there is a member either of the Democratic Unionist Party uh, or uh, uh, um, associated points of view. And I did ask the clerk if, these, uh, if she knew that I was a Roman Catholic. I might not be welcome on that uh, floor. And then I met well, we've been listening there to uh, 
News conference given by the uh, newest MP in the Commons, George Galloway, elected in Rochdale last week. Uh, laying out what we might well find is the uh, Galloway manifesto for his time in Parliament, of course, before the next election that is due uh, sometime this year. So he's I trying to make Rochdale that. great again. He said that uh, one of the ways he's going to do that is by making sure the football team doesn't go into liquidation, but he also talked about child poverty and making sure that Rochdale gets its own postal code. He also talked, of course, about the war in Gaza, the issue that he campaigned around when winning that Rochdale by-election, uh, describing the situation as a genocide, saying that the International Court of Justice says there is a plausible case and uh, intrigued as to why that has not been covered more. Also attacked uh, other broadcasters and uh, concerns, says he is concerned that uh, the next election is going to be about Muslims and taking away civil liberties. Also suggests he's going to put a candidate up against the deputy leader of the Labour Party, Angela Rader, in Ashton Underline. All right, plenty more to come this afternoon on Sky News. We'll get some analysis of what we heard from Mr Galloway very soon. Back. Let's uh, get some analysis of what we heard from the new MP, or re-elected MP, we should say, George Galloway. Our political correspondent, Tamara Cohen, is standing by and was listening into some of that news conference that Mr Galloway just gave. Tamara, great to have you with us. So, I mean, there's quite a lot to, to pull out there. Why don't we start with, you know, the sort of the challenge that he has laid down to uh, the parties, the government and the, the opposition party, to not have this kind of divisive politics that he talks about, this idea to, that the PM is planning to whip up hatred of Muslims. Well, look, George Galloway is back, and it's very clear from what he just said there that he is going to be making a lot of noise in Parliament. Of course, uh, he's done more time in Parliament, as he was pointing out there, than most of the uh, party leaders or indeed the MPs there. He was a Labour MP from 1987 to 2005, returned with his respect party uh, in Bethnal Green and then later in Bradford. And, of course, now with his Workers' Party, he won the Rochdale by-election in a shock uh, for 
all of the party leaders uh, last Friday. Uh, what did he say? Well, he started off by saying with his customary modesty that he would add to the political intelligence in the room in Parliament and that he would be trying to speak at Prime Minister's questions in the budget debate and at every opportunity. You'll remember that at that by-election win, he said, Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza. He accused the Prime Minister of wanting to make uh, the next election about... Uh, it I paraphrase, demonising Muslims. Uh, he also uh, talked about uh, the conflict. Um, he, he accused um, uh, Israel of carrying out a genocide in Gaza, and he said he was not afraid of using that term, which, of course, is something that the International Court of Justice is only investigating. And he also uh, made a comparison, which our reporter Matthew Thompson challenged him, him on just there, uh, saying that people would not question him if he was uh, making the Holocaust the centre of his campaign in 1940 or 1941. And, of course, the official uh, definition of anti-Semitism makes clear that's a very inappropriate comparison, and he was asked about it uh, just there, but he said he was going to make it. We know that George Galloway has... The, the, throughout his career pushed uh, foreign affairs and we expect him uh, to do so when he now that he's back in Parliament he said he would have no qualms about working with the Scottish National Party although he doesn't agree with them on independence in trying to bring about another vote which is likely uh, to put Labour in yet another difficult position he said that people wouldn't be there if they didn't think that his party was going to mount further challenges bring in other candidates to stand against uh, sitting MPs at the election, well, it remains to see whether they have any uh, figures with the, the sort of recognition that he has in order to make that happen. But certainly it's very clear that even uh, on his own, the only MP for that party, George Galloway, is a figure who is going to be making waves and he wants to make sure that everyone in Parliament knows it. Yeah, absolutely. And Tamara, uh, what is the sense uh, of, of the way that George Galloway is challenging some of uh, the, the major parties? I mean, he said that he's going to be standing a candidate or at least an independent with his support against Angela Rayner. He mentioned Ilford as well, which is where, where Streeting is the MP. Do the parties have a choice now, you know, whether to try and ignore him or sort of fight him on the issues, which I guess is what he wants? He's seen whether uh, his workers' party has anyone who would attract significant numbers of votes. Of course, he's an internationally well-known figure, George Galloway, and the other people in the Respect Party uh, very much aren't. So uh, the idea that this is going to pose a challenge to Labour and all different kinds of constituencies is yet to be borne out because there's not very long until the general election and we don't know who these candidates uh, might be. Uh, people have compared it to, say, the Reform Party, but they have been around for, for some time uh, and the threat they pose to the Conservatives, I think that is, is slightly different. But yes, he is making that threat. He says he is going to stand against uh, sitting Labour MPs and uh, in seats where uh, contests are close, yes, they might pick up a few votes, although at the moment, of course, Labour are soaring ahead in, in the polls and all all those uh, seats that you just mentioned are looking pretty pretty safe for Labour. But I think the challenge he poses, certainly over the next few months, is he's made clear that he wants to give Keir Starmer a difficult time. He wants to, to uh, push the issue of Gaza, push other issues like austerity. You heard him there talking about wanting to make Rochdale great again, appropriating Donald Trump's uh, slogan there. And, you know, he is going to be trying to get as much attention as he can, whether he's going to be allowed to speak in many of these debates. He said he wanted to speak in the budget debate on Wednesday uh, or, or any of the other uh, debates that will go on over the next few months, he is there to make life difficult for the Labour leader, which perhaps explains uh, some of the issues that went on in Rochdale and why uh, Labour continued to hold on to their candidate for perhaps longer than they should have done. But uh, he is there to make waves and uh, over the next uh, few months we'll see whether it is just rhetoric or something that puts real pressure uh, on the party leader. We will indeed. All right, tomorrow for now in Westminster. Appreciate that. Thank you. Well, the Chancellor of the Exchequer has confirmed that he is looking to try and cut taxes again in Wednesday's budget, but has played down the chances of substantial reductions, insisting he needs to act responsibly. Jeremy Hunt is reportedly considering further cuts to public spending to boost any giveaways in what will be the government's final opportunity ahead of the general election. Well, here's what Mr Hunt had to say a little earlier. We believe that if you look around the world, the countries which are growing the fastest, whether it's North America or Asia, 
have lower taxes because that makes a more dynamic, uh, more energetic, more entrepreneurial economy. Uh, so we do want to move to a lower taxed economy, but we're only going to do so in a way that is responsible um, and recognises that uh, there are things that taxes pay for, uh, that we couldn't cut taxes by borrowing. Uh, we'll do so in a responsible way. Uh, but if we can spend money on public services more efficiently, then uh, that will mean less pressure on taxpayers. You're reportedly going to crack down on non-DOMs. Um, have you run out of your own ideas? Are you setting traps for Labour? Why are you pinching Labour policies? You'll have to see on Wednesday precisely what I'm going to announce. Uh, but let me be clear, there is a, a plan for growth uh, compared to the Labour Party that has just had to abandon the central plan they had for growth, this 28 billion uh, number that uh, one day they were supporting, the next day they weren't. Uh, our plan is working. We've halved inflation. Uh, we have 800 more people in work for every day Conservatives have been in office since 2010. More jobs, more investment, lower inflation. We are laying the foundations for long-term growth. And a reminder, we're going to have full coverage of the budget from 11am on Wednesday here on Sky News. All right, let's take you live to France, where both houses of the French Parliament are meeting to vote on enshrining abortion rights into the Constitution. It will be the first country uh, in the world to do so if it passes, which it's likely to. Legislation promised by President Macron says the bill is intended to make a woman's right to have an abortion in France irreversible. Well, joining us now from Paris is the political commentator Agnès Poirier. Agnès, it's always good to have you on the programme. Thank you very much for making the time. Uh, was I right to say that this is likely to pass? Oh, yes, uh, no doubt about it. I mean, they, they, need, they need a majority of uh, the three-fifths um, of, um, of both uh, upper and lower um, chambers, uh, that is to say the National Assembly and the Senate, uh, but it looks extremely likely it will uh, pass. Uh, there are about 925 people uh, gathered in Versailles. That's the reason they are in Versailles, not in Paris, because... Um, because it's so crowded. And uh, so there's this uh, place at the Palace uh, of Versailles that has been built um, more than the, about 150 years ago, especially for the French Parliament to be able to gather. Yeah, for, for both, both chambers. And Agnes, talk to us about why now, why has France decided to, to enshrine this within the Constitution? Well, that's interesting because you could argue that, you know, French women are safe in France, uh, safe uh, in their freedom to abort if uh, they so wish. But actually, because of what's happening in the world and outside of France and because uh, because abortion rights have been rescinded uh, partially or fully in, I think, 21 American uh, states, well, um, you know, there's a feeling that we live in uncertain uh, times and that history doesn't go necessarily in the right direction for women and that women's rights is something that uh, is quite fragile. So even though French women feel quite, um, you know, uh, secured, if you'd like, and that their abortion rights are guaranteed, uh, it will make it uh, a fundamental right by uh, that revision of the Constitution. So Article 34 will guarantee that freedom for uh, women, and you never know, um, you know, what uh, can happen in the future. Yeah, and that's exactly the point, isn't it? Because, of course, uh, President Macron's term comes to an end. There is the uh, growing strength of uh, Marine Le Pen's party. Is that the right, the far right in France? Uh, are they against this idea? No, they are not, actually. No political party in France is against abortion right. And Marine Le Pen today is uh, attending, of course, and said that the, it will be 